You're listening to the Sermon Podcast of North Valley Baptist Church. This week's sermon is preached by Pastor Paul Webble. Well, this week I uh, sent Faith Baptist Church an email with the passages from each gospel account that they should read for each day of the week during Passion Week. And I'm not sure if any of you guys have done this before, but if you have, you may have noticed something kind of interesting when you go through all four gospel accounts. There's a lot of differences, isn't there? Especially when it comes to the resurrection. And actually, as a matter of fact, there are so many differences that it can often be confusing on where you're at in the story itself. And some people of course, have determined because the Bible seems to contradict itself. I'm sure you can finish it, right? It can't be true. The biblical authors, you know, they they must have been confused, you know, or they just made up things and didn't tell the other authors. So, you know, we got what we got. And this has led many to conclude that the resurrection was just a big conspiracy. You know, nothing more than an elaborate, well-distributed myth. And as the Christian church has held on to this lie throughout the centuries only because of superstition or, in some cases, control or just because, you know, it's blind tradition. That's just what we do. And those who love to hate God have always said these kind of things. They love to attack the resurrection. But the question is why? Why is the resurrection the bullseye of so many attacks? Well, it's simply because you can't be a Christian unless you believe in the resurrection. It's not one of those minor doctrines of Christianity. You know, we can't just agree to disagree on this issue. The resurrection is one, and we're going to see today, of the three major pillars of the Christian faith. You have to believe it. And so the enemies of God know that they can prove that the resurrection is wrong, then Christianity is wrong. If Jesus didn't rise from the dead, then He didn't conquer death. Your sins are not atoned for. He's not coming back to judge the living and the dead. And as the Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 15, we are of all people most to be pitied. And again, Satan knows this. That's why every Easter season, there's always news articles, right? TV specials, documentaries that claim, you know, we've got some new evidence that we haven't discovered in 2,000 years, but this is going to prove that the resurrection is a myth. Now, for those of you who don't know me, I am an expositional preacher like Scott. I normally work book by book through verse by verse seeking to excavate from the text the authorial intent, the original author's intent to the original audience. And then I try to illustrate that truth and apply that truth to our lives. But this morning, we're going to do something a little bit different. We are going to work through a text later on in the sermon, but what I first want to do is I want to help you better understand why there are four different accounts of the resurrection in the four Gospels, and how those differences actually work together to validate the resurrection account. Also, because our faith at times can be shaken by all this God-hating secular sources that are around us constantly trying to disprove the Bible, I want to use this time to encourage you and to help you have a defense against their arguments and against their false claims that the Bible cannot be trustworthy. Now, When you listen to these secular people talk, you know, it sounds like there's this, there's been this huge gathering of scholars around the world, right? You know, they, like a theological think tank and, and their sole purpose is to figure out this unsolvable mystery between the differences of the four gospels. And after countless sessions, you know, the greatest minds the world has to offer, they have finally come to the conclusion that the resurrection could not have happened. You know, it's just a myth that uneducated people believe. That's how they make it sound, don't they? But I want you to know that the answer to this question is not very complicated. 
There are actually three simple answers that help us bring clarity to, to this. And I put this in your notes if you have them this morning. Number one, the reason why there are four gospel accounts instead of just one is that God wanted to emphasize four different themes in the life of Christ. Each gospel writer had a different goal or a different purpose in writing their gospel. For example, Matthew was written primarily to a Jewish audience, and it was demonstrated to prove that Jesus is the long-awaited king of the Jews. He was the Messiah that they were waiting for. So everything that he writes in his gospel is around that theme. Mark, on the other hand, was written to primarily Roman or a Gentile audience, and Mark presents Jesus as the suffering servant of the Lord and focuses more on Christ's humanity. And as Scott said, it's a very fast-paced book. So it's then this, then this, then this. And so a lot of times the details that we get in other places are just not there. Luke, now because Luke was a well-educated doctor, he was a physician, he writes his account as a well-read, well-researched historian, right? And he usually gives us details that the other four, uh, four or other three accounts don't give us. You know, he focuses on Jesus' compassion for the lowly in society, for the Gentiles, Samaritans, the women, the, the tax collectors, and so forth. And John, finally, he writes with an evangelistic and apologetic purpose. And he really helps us out. He's the only one of the four that actually gives us his purpose in John 20, 31, where he says, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in His name. So as you can see, it was never intended for any of these Gospel writers to write down a comprehensive account of the life of Christ or of the resurrection. And if you think about it, that would have been impossible, right? I mean, the Apostle John even says it in John 21, 25. Now, there are many, also many other things that Jesus did. Were every one of them to be written, I suppose that the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. I mean, just think about how crazy it would be for someone to try to, to write everything about a person's life. And so when the Gospel writers write about the resurrection, they're only writing about a part of what happened. The part that they want to emphasize for their purpose. And so it's invalid and really kind of absurd to say, well, because they don't seem to include all the information, therefore the Bible is wrong. Second thing that helps bring clarity is that if one gospel writer includes certain information and another gospel writer leaves out other information, that doesn't mean the Bible contradicts itself. Think of it this way. If I were to tell you that you know, I went to a baseball game and when I was there I ran into Scott and Nate, and, uh, you know, we had a good time and we watched the game. And me telling you the story, you would not think that only Scott and Nate were at the game, would you? No, of course not. There's a lot of people there. But I am pointing out that somebody that we both know, Scott and Nate, were at the game. And it's the same, true with, same is true with the resurrection. If an author says that Mary Magdalene was at the tomb and another account says that a bunch of women is at the tomb, that doesn't mean the two accounts contradict. It just means one author focuses on one certain individual while the other doesn't. You understand what I'm saying? All right, number three. The gospel writers don't tell us everything we want to know. And sometimes we can be frustrated with this, right? They only tell us everything God wants us to know. And even though all four gospels give us an accurate account about the life of Christ, His death and resurrection, it was, again, never their intent to give us a complete chronological account of every single detail that happened. God tells us what we need to know, and each gospel writer tells us that we need to know it within the individual author's theme for the book that he is writing. So as you can see, why there are differences in all four gospels? Not that hard of a question, is it? It's not some unsolvable mystery that disproves the resurrection. On the contrary, it actually strengthens it. I mean, think about it. you got four accounts of an event, four different authors, four different points of view, with four different purposes that don't contradict. Right? It actually proves its validity. All right, 
What I want to do now is I want to actually show you what I'm talking about from the four Gospels. What I've done this week is I've read through the four Gospels and I've put the events of the resurrection into chronological order. Now, I'm sure that my account isn't perfect. Actually, there are a few ways you can take all the information in the four Gospels and arrange them in a way that fit together. But my account is going to have all the facts and they, and they are given in a chronological order. And as we go through this, you're going you're gonna to quickly see that there's no contradictions and God's Word perfectly fits together. And once we lay this out, then we're going to look at all the significance of the resurrection that relates to us today. You know, why is it so important for us to believe in the resurrection? All right, so picking up where Scott left off Friday, after Jesus is tortured and crucified on the cross, he yields up his spirit to a father and he dies. And then a soldier who's supervising at the crucifixion was told that you know he had to hurry things along because the Sabbath was approaching and they needed to get the men off the cross before the Sabbath. In order to do this now, the soldier is actually going to go and break the legs of them, which would keep them from being able to push up and breathe. So essentially, he's going to asphyxiate them by breaking their legs. So he goes to the first two criminals who are crucified with Jesus and breaks their legs. And when he gets to Jesus... He sees that he's already dead. So instead of breaking his legs, he takes the spear, pierces him to make sure that he's dead. Blood and water come out, and we know that he is actually dead. Then after learning that Jesus is dead, two of his secret followers, you have Joseph of Arimathea, who is a a rich member of the Jewish council, that same Jewish council, by the way, that paid Judas 30 pieces of silver to betray him, And then a man named Nicodemus, another member of the Jewish council who was the teacher in Israel and a member of the Pharisees and the one that went to Jesus by night in John chapter 3 where we get John 3.16, that same Nicodemus. Well, both of these men, they go to Pilate and they ask for the body of Jesus. And once Pilate learned that Jesus was in fact dead, they were given permission to take Jesus' body. And so Joseph and Nicodemus went to the site of the crucifixion, and because it was getting close to the evening, they really had to hurry and take care of Jesus' body. Because you see, for the Jews, the next day, which would have been the Sabbath, begins at 6 p.m. Okay, And so they had to get everything finished before 6 p.m. because they can't work on the Sabbath according to the Mosaic Law. Now, the Bible says that Nicodemus brought with him about 75 pounds of burial spices and other materials to embalm the body of Jesus. And so after they took down his body from the cross, they went to a nearby garden where Joseph's tomb was that has never been used. It was carved out of a rock, the Bible says. And they laid Jesus in there, and then they made this kind of paste with all this spices and wrapped his body the best that they could, kind of like a mummy, so think of a mummy, placed him in the tomb, and then the Bible says they rolled a huge stone in front of the tomb. And while they were doing all this, there were some women, and most likely some men, who were sitting outside the tomb watching them do this. And we know that amongst these people, we've got Mary Magdalene mentioned, Mary the mother of Joseph, and they were all grieving over the death of Jesus. And so again, because the Sabbath is right there, they kind of part way deal with Jesus' body and they were planning on coming back on Sunday to finish the job. Now before we continue, I want us to take a moment and kind of try to imagine what these guys were going through. Um, How must they have felt? I mean, just think about how devastated they must have been. You know, they probably haven't slept in at least 36 hours, right? They've watched their Lord, their their teacher, their friend be beaten and suffer more than any man ever has. They're they're, they're worn out. They are just distraught. And they have no idea what to do next. I mean, they truly thought that Jesus was this long-awaited Messiah, the Savior of Israel, the one that was going to rescue them from Roman oppression, rule over the nation as the king, rule on David's throne, and set everything up right. And now he's dead. And they have no idea what to do. But you know what? They should not have been confused. They shouldn't have even been mourning. You know, they should have been going at the house, having dinner. Okay, yeah, we'll see him in a couple days. 
Because how many times do we read in the gospel account how often Jesus said to them, hey guys, listen, you know, so the man has got to go to the cross. I got to suffer. I got to die. He's going to be betrayed. How many times do we read over and over and over again that he was going to suffer, he was going to die, and then three days later he was going to rise from the dead? But none of his disciples yet believed. Not even Peter, James, or John. It seemed like none of them remembered that Jesus even said any of those things. But you know what's interesting? The opposition remembered, right? The Pharisees knew. I mean, they've witnessed Jesus do all these amazing miracles, even though they've tried to stop him. And just recently, Lazarus just got raised from the dead, and they were actually seeking to kill Lazarus to, to hush up the whole you know, coming back from the dead thing. And so they are so scared and they are so worried that they have an idea. They go to Pilate and they say, all right, Pilate, we need you to station some guards around this man's tomb. Now, I, I got to say, can you imagine how that conversation went? You want me to do what? Place guards around a dead man? I mean, I don't know about you, but I can't remember the last time I saw security guards at the local cemetery. There's not many dead condemned men getting up out of their graves trying to escape. And so it's interesting how they justify their request. You know, they say to him, well, you know, when Jesus was alive, he claimed that he was going to rise again in three days. And we think that his disciples, yeah, they're going to sneak in. They're going to steal his body and say that he's risen from the dead. And so, I, I think just to shut them up, Pilate says, all right, go ahead. you got a guard of soldiers. Go and, and make it as secure as you can. And that's what they did, right? We see that the, the guards went to the tomb. They rolled a huge stone in front of it, and they, they put the seal on the tomb itself, saying that if anybody broke this seal, the weight of the entire Roman Empire will come down upon them. And these Roman guards camped out in front of the tomb to guard a dead body for three days. That's kind of a gravy job, huh? Well, Sabbath finally comes and goes, and, and finally it's Sunday morning. And there were some women, and we don't really know how many there were. The Bible actually doesn't tell us. There could have been 10, there could have been 50, there could have been more. We don't know. But what we do know is that there were some women who agreed to meet at the tomb at first light on Sunday morning. And these women would have been coming from you know, different locations, all working their way to the tomb. They left when it was dark, and by the time they got there, it just started to get light. The sun was just starting to rise, and we know that among those women, the Bible mentions Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome. We also see that they were bringing their own spices to finish the burial process as well. Now, while these women were en route from their homes to the tomb, Something happens at the tomb. There was a huge earthquake. The stone was rolled away from the tomb and an angel sitting on top of the stone. And because the angel's appearance, the Bible says, was like lightning and his clothes was white as snow, the soldiers were terrified. And as soon as he saw them, the Bible says, they passed out like a dead man. They fainted. Those hardened soldiers fainted. And when they finally woke up, they realized, uh-oh, we're in trouble. Jesus' body is gone. And so, for a Roman soldier, they know that failing at their task meant certain death. So they got up, they hurried back in the city, and they went to talk to the chief priest. I guess they were hoping you know, they could maybe justify themselves and maybe get the chief priest to, to speak up on their behalf so they wouldn't be killed. Well, they tell the chief priest what happens, and then the chief priest's response is pretty wild, too. He goes, all right, this is what I want you soldiers to do. Just tell everyone that the disciples snuck in at night while you were on guard, on pain of death. They rolled the stone away while you weren't looking and you didn't hear them. They snuck into the tomb. They unwrapped Jesus' body, took the body, then placed the wrappings back so it looked like a body again and then left, and you didn't know, and you didn't see him. And what's amazing was the soldier said, okay. And then the priest said, you know what? We're going to take care of Pilate so you don't get in trouble. 
And just to make sure that you don't say anything else, here's a little bit of money to keep you quiet. Well, meanwhile, just after the soldiers leave to go into town from the tomb, the women start to arrive at the tomb. And just before they get there, they start talking to each other, and they're like, okay, guys, um, how are we going to roll away this massive stone? I mean, we've got to finish preparing Jesus' body. And I know there's a bunch of us here, but we're just a bunch of women. That stone's huge. What are we going to do? But when they got there, the stone was already rolled away, and they were able just to walk into the tomb. And as soon as they got into the tomb, they see there's nobody there either. They see his wrappings, you know, all lying where they're supposed to be, but no Jesus. And the Bible says that they were really confused. I mean, if you think about it, yeah. I mean, how, how do you get a body like sucked out of the wrappings? Almost like, beam me up, Scotty, right? Everything is right there and the body's gone. Well, while they're staring there, all of a sudden, two angels appear and they are so terrified that they fall down to the ground. And what happens every time an angel appears, they say the common angel greeting, right? Don't be afraid. It seems to be like, you know, seeing an angel is a scary deal. Well, they say to them, the angels say to the women, why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen. Then, I think it's interesting, they kind of reprimand the women. And they say, remember how he told you when he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and crucified and on the third day rise? Again, repeat it again. And I kind of hear him saying like, what's wrong with you people? You know, you heard Jesus all the time say these things. He just talked about it in the upper room not too long ago. But obviously, they didn't believe. It must have just seemed to them too strange, too unbelievable. The angels then tell the women to go back, tell the rest of the disciples, and to remind them of what Jesus said and tell them that he is risen. But the women, for some reason, decide to not obey what the angel said to do. We don't know why, but the women remain silent, except for Mary Magdalene. She does speak up, but she doesn't repeat the message. What Mary says is, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have laid Him. Well, as soon as Peter and John hear this, they jump up, run to the tomb, I'm guessing because John's younger, he gets there first, but he stays there, doesn't want to go in, he's afraid. Peter comes in, barges by John, goes into the tomb, and the body's not there. But what's interesting is, John, when he sees it, do you remember his response? He remembered all that Jesus said, and he finally believed. Well, Peter and John, they leave the tomb. They go back home. Meanwhile, Mary Magdalene decides to leave the other women and go back to the tomb for the second time. I mean, at this point, she really doesn't know what to do. She is unbelievably sad. She, you know, she is grieved. She hasn't slept probably in over three and a half days. She doesn't know what to do with herself. So she says, you know, I'm just going to go back to the last place I saw Jesus, at the tomb. Now, if we don't know exactly what happened to the other women, we don't know if they decided to go home or hang around that area for a while, but what we do know is that after Peter and John left them, after Mary Magdalene leaves the tomb, Jesus appears to the group of women. And when he does, he says this to them, do not be afraid. And as soon as they see Jesus, they just fall down and cling on to Jesus' feet. And he then tells them a second time, Go tell this word to my brothers. I'm alive. And then tell them, go to Galilee, and I'm going to meet them there in Galilee. And so the women this time, they finally get it. They obey. They head back to the disciples. They tell them what happened, and they gave them Jesus' message. Meanwhile, Mary Magdalene is back at the tomb for the second time. Again, she's just an emotional wreck, overtired, not knowing how to process this first encounter with the angel, not really understanding where Jesus' body is. And so she's just there. And when she gets there to the tomb, she walks in, and this time she sees two angels 
one on each side of where Jesus' body had lain. And the angel said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? You get it now? It's like, what is wrong with you, woman? We just told you what happened. You don't know where Jesus' body is? I just told you. He's alive. He's risen. These angels expected her to be rejoicing. Instead, because of her unbelief, she's distraught. And you can really see this in Mary's reply. They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Hmm. Well, after she said that, she turned around, and there was somebody behind her. And the Bible says that she didn't know that it was Jesus. Now, this could have been because she was blinded by her tears, or perhaps she was looking down with grief. But most likely, it was because Jesus didn't allow her yet to recognize him. Just like he did with the two disciples on the road to Emmaus, he hid himself from them. And Jesus says to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? And the text says that she supposed that he was the gardener. And he said to him, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him and I will take him away. Not quite sure how she thinks she's going to handle a dead body on her own, but... But at this point, God removes the blinders and Jesus says, Mary, can you imagine how she must have felt? Teacher, Rabboni, she just clings on to him. She must have been thinking, I've lost you once. I hate losing you again. And then Jesus says to her, do not cling to me. For I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers. Say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. So Mary Magdalene left the tomb for a second time, went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and told them all that happened to her. There you have it. That's the four gospel account of everything that took place. Do you see it all fits together perfectly? No contradictions. On the contrary, each gospel writer gives us another piece of the puzzle that paints a clear and detailed picture of what actually took, uh, actually took place. Now, you might be thinking, all right, Pastor, but why are you laboring this point? Why, why do we keep going over this and over this? And Why is it so important that we must believe that the resurrection is true and trustworthy? Why do we come here on Easter Sunday to specifically celebrate the Easter? Why do we meet on Sunday mornings as a church at all the time? Why is this such a big deal? And maybe you're here this morning and you're thinking to yourself, well, I really didn't come here to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Maybe you're here because, you know, a family member or a friend wanted you to come. Or maybe you're here because, you know, it's, it's your tradition. This is what you do on Easter. But deep down, you really don't believe in the resurrection. You don't really see what the big deal is. Why are we singing the songs that we are singing? Why are we reading the scriptures that we are reading? But I want you to know, you're not alone. It just so happens that in the church of Corinth, Corinth, there were some people there who didn't believe in the resurrection 2,000 years ago. And it just so happens that the Apostle Paul thought the resurrection was such a big deal that he wrote the longest chapter in the book of 1 Corinthians on the resurrection. And it just so happens we're going to look at that passage now. So if you have your Bibles, please turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I love how the Holy Spirit works. I did not tell Scott to read 1 Corinthians 15 this morning. We're going to look primarily at verses 12 through 19, but before we do, I want to give you a bit of context to our passage. As my church knows, context is king. That's right. Because what comes before our verse is very significant for us to understand our text itself. Now, in chapter 15, Paul begins the chapter by showing us actually the importance of the resurrection, which we are going to look at in a minute. And then he goes on to show the certainty of the resurrection. Then he deals with the consequences of rejecting the resurrection. He then deals with the order of the resurrection and the nature of resurrected bodies. 
And then he ends the chapter by showing us the final destiny of those who are resurrected, both believers and unbelievers. But Paul begins the chapter by showing us the importance of the resurrection. So look down with me at verse 1. Now it reminds you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved. Stop there for a second. Notice how Paul begins by saying that he preached to them the gospel. But what is this gospel that Paul preached? Now, for those of you who don't really hang out in Christian circles very often, this word gospel simply means good news. So whenever you see the word gospel in your Bibles, you can just substitute it for good news. Now I want to remind you, brothers, of the good news, the gospel, I preach to you. And that good news that was preached to them, they received. That is, they accepted it. They took it into themselves. They owned it. Not only that, Paul says here that they are standing on it. In other words, they are placing their trust in this good news. And beyond that, it is this gospel, he says in verse 2, by which you are being saved. If you hold fast to the word I preach to you, unless you believed in vain. So, according to our text here, if you have received the gospel, if you are standing on it, if you are placing your trust in it, that word has saved you. It is believing in the good news, that gospel message that saves you. And it saves you from the eternal wrath of God that will be poured out on everyone who does not believe in this gospel. And notice what Paul says here. The only way for anyone to be saved is to hold fast or believe in the gospel. There is no other way to be forgiven except through this gospel. And so often in our culture and in many different denominations and many different religions, there's this idea that we can earn our way. We can do things to make God pleased, to make God um, you know, like us or love us or be acceptable before God. So often we're told there are many roads, roads that lead to heaven, are we not? But according to our verse and many, many other, there is only one way. There is only one way to be saved, and that is to hear the gospel, understand the gospel, and in faith receive the gospel. That's it. No other way. True biblical Christianity, listen to me, is a very narrow-minded, closed-minded faith. Very narrow-minded. Contrary to what most churches teach, not everyone is getting in. Now, this really makes us ask the question, what is the gospel, right? If there's no other way to be saved, then we really need to understand what the gospel is. And you know what? Paul does it again. Look at verse 3. He's going to tell us, For I delivered to you of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, first thing. He was buried, second thing. That He was raised on the third day according with the Scripture. There's the third thing. So the good news that the Gospel message is what saves you is the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's it. There is no other way to get in. Good intentions won't save you. Trying hard to be good won't save you. Giving money to the church and going to confession won't save you. It's only through repenting, turning from your sin, turning to Christ, and believing in this gospel that you're saved. Not only that, if you believe in Him, the Bible says that He will take His righteousness, His perfect obedience to the law of God, and give it to you. Credit it to you. So not only are our sins nailed on the cross, completely paid for, the wrath of God satisfied by what Jesus did, but His perfect obedience, His righteousness is credited to us. That's what theologians call double imputation. You want to, you know, wow your friends, there it is. Double imputation. Our just punishment on Christ, Christ's 
perfect obedience to us. That's how we can have a relationship with him. That's how we can be made right with God. And again, I am laboring this because this is not an obscure doctrine. It's not something, again, that we can agree to disagree on. You have to believe in the resurrection or one of those pillars is gone. It's impossible to be saved unless you believe in the resurrection. Simply put, no resurrection, no good news. Now, I do want you to know that I understand that believing in the resurrection is a hard thing to do. I get it. I mean, how many people have you met that have been raised from the dead? It doesn't happen very often. Even the Apostle Paul in his day had to deal with many who did not believe in the resurrection. There was actually a whole Jewish religious group called the Sadducees who found, whose foundational belief was to reject the resurrection. That's why they were sad, you see. And Paul knows this. And so he is going to deal with the implications or the consequences if there was no such thing as the resurrection. So this is going to be our main point here. Look down at verse 12. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there's no resurrection of the dead, here we go, listen, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that He raised Christ, whom He did not raise if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. All right, so from these eight verses, Paul actually points out seven consequences that arise in believing that there is no resurrection. And his whole purpose here is to kill this false doctrine of no resurrection. And as we're going through this, you're going to see he doesn't pull any punches here. He attacks this thing head on. He knows that the gospel rises and falls on the resurrection. And because of this, he starts off with the biggest one first. This is what one theologian put as the nuclear warhead consequence. Number one, if there is no resurrection from the dead, your Savior is dead and He cannot save you. Paul actually states this five times in these eight verses. Verse 13, but if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. Look at verse 14. If the dead are not raised, Christ has not been raised. Look at the end of verse 15. He, speaking of God, raised Christ, whom He did not raise, if it is true that the dead are not raised. Look at the first part of verse 17. And if Christ has not been raised. You see, this is the key issue. If there is no such thing as someone rising from the dead, if men in general are not raised, then it is impossible for Jesus who was a man, to have been raised from the dead. Right? You can't believe that Jesus was just a good teacher or a prophet or even the Messiah. Like we saw back in verse 4, without the resurrection, there is no gospel, there is no good news, and no one is saved. Without the resurrection, you don't have a Savior who can save you. He is still in the grave. He has not conquered death. He didn't prove that He was the Son of God and the long-awaited Messiah. He didn't fulfill all the Old Testament prophecies, which mean that God's a liar. And because He didn't fulfill His own prophecies, that means He's a liar. If there's no resurrection, then Jesus is still dead and dead people can't save anyone. Now, that is the first and major consequence of not believing in the resurrection. And the other six consequences Paul is about to give flows out of them. Let's just look at them real quickly. If the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, number two, the gospel that you preach to others is vain. Look down at the end of verse 14, or at verse 14. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain. Paul just said that the heart of the gospel is Christ's death and resurrection on our behalf. So, 
Without the resurrection, the good news would actually be what? Bad news. And there'd be no, there'd be nothing worth preaching. Jesus didn't conquer sin or death or hell. And so there's no way for us to be forgiven, to have victory over sin, death, and hell, which makes evangelism, sharing the gospel, meaningless. But praise God, he was raised, right? Praise God, we can go and preach the gospel to dying sinners. It is such a privilege to be able to lovingly show someone that they truly are a sinner and how they have sinned against a holy God and God will punish sins. And then to get to tell them the good news. Listen, you either suffer in eternity in hell for your own sins, paying the penalty of your infinite offense against an infinitely holy God, or you can repent, turn from your sins, turn from your wicked way, receive Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, place your faith in His death, burial, and resurrection to save you. What are you going to do? And every once in a while, by God's grace, that person you're witnessing to, God opens their eyes, grants them faith. They break down right in front of you and you see a miracle of God. And they get saved. And their lives change. This is the power of the Gospel. That's why Paul says here that if Christ has not been raised, our preaching would be vain or, or empty, without purpose, foolish, futile. Without the resurrection, we're just preaching a worthless myth. This brings us to the third consequence of not believing in the resurrection. Your faith in Christ would be vain and worthless. Look at the end of verse 14. And your faith is in vain. Now, this word vain here is used in these both verses. And it really, it's, it's the personal aspect of our faith that would be vain. If Christ has not been raised, then our personal faith is empty without purpose, foolish, and futile. And he says it again in verse 17. Look down there. If Christ has not been raised, your personal faith is futile. It's trash. If the dead do not rise, Christ did not rise, we will not rise. And again, a dead Savior can't do anything to save us. Not only that, if Christ has not been raised, number four, all witnesses to and preachers of the resurrection would be liars against God. Look at verse 15. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that He raised Christ, whom He did not raise if it is true that the dead are not raised. What he's saying here is that if there's no such thing as a resurrection of the dead, then every person who claimed to have witnessed the risen Christ, right, including the apostles, the prophets, other leaders of the New Testament church, those 500 witnesses that He appeared to at once, and every other person who has preached the risen Christ from the first century to today is what? A liar. A liar. I love what John MacArthur wrote on this. He said, quote, If the apostles, the prophets, and the New Testament writers lied about the heart of the Gospel, why should they be believed about anything else? All the New Testament truth stands or falls together based on the resurrection. End quote. And that is so true. Besides, how many people do you know that would be willing to be beaten and tortured, imprisoned, martyred for a lie? Such self-sacrifice doesn't come from charlatans. People don't die to preserve a lie. This brings us to the fifth consequence of not believing in the resurrection. If Christ has not been raised, number five, you are still in your sins. Look again at verse 17. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. So without the resurrection, we are in the same boat as un every unbelieving pagan. If Jesus has not rise from the dead, then sin and death won the victory over Christ and therefore continues to be victorious over the rest of us. If Christ was not raised, His death was in vain, our faith in Him is in vain, and our sins are still counted against us. We are still dead in trespasses and sins and will forever remain spiritually dead and sinful. If that wasn't enough, Paul gives us a sixth consequence 
of not believing in the resurrection. Every believer of every age would be in hell and you will never see them again. Look at verse 18. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. Now, this have fallen asleep is just a euphemism for dying. And so what he is saying here that everybody who claimed to be a believer in the past has perished. And this strong word perished actually means perished in the lake of fire, eternal destruction in outer darkness, where they will spend eternal torment without God and without hope. That's what perish means. It's a final perishing. But again, praise the Lord that Jesus has been raised from the dead. And those of us who have repented and believed in Him, we are rescued from this final perishing. But if you are here this morning and you are not a believer, then this final perishing is what you have to look forward to. For every unbeliever, because of your sin, you will spend an eternity in pain and suffering in this lake of fire. Fire. No, no partying in hell with your buddies, like the world says. But you're alone, forever burning, in agony, tormented, in utter darkness, where the Bible says there is weeping and gnashing in teeth. And, and even though this suffering the Bible describes is truly indescribable, if there was a chance that one day you could come out of this hell. If while you were there, you knew that even if you had to suffer 10,000 years, that there was going to be an end and you would be released from hell, you'd have a little hope, right? But, just like heaven is forever, so is hell. Without end, no escape, no release, and no hope. This is what Paul is talking about here in verse 18. Paul's argument is super clear. If Christ has not been raised, then faith in Christ is futile and worthless. And everybody, every believer is still in their sins, still unforgiven, still under the just judgment of God, just like the rest of the world. This brings us to our seventh and final consequence of not believing in the resurrection. In light of all these consequences, Paul says, number seven, we are to be pitied more than all men. Look down at verse 19. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. Without Jesus rising from the dead, then there's no Savior, no forgiveness, no gospel, no meaningful faith, no life, and no hope of eternal blessings. So being a Christian today would be pointless. It, it, we'd be pitiable for it. Pitied because if our only hope would be to trust Christ in this life, what's the point? Is it easy to be a Christian? No. We'd be fools. We should just eat, drink, be merry because tomorrow we're going to die. Why not just get as much stuff and happiness we can get now because, you know, it's going to be over any day. And if you've come here this Easter morning and you do not believe in the resurrection, I hope that this sermon has made it very clear that you have a choice to make. There is good news. You can be rescued. You can be forgiven by a gracious, loving God, a loving Savior. Or you can one day pay for your own sins. That's the only choice we have. And the scary part is we don't know when that day is going to be. I mean, someone like me, 40 years old, I think I have a long time ahead of me. But I could have an aneurysm in my brain and walk out the door and I'm done. Or we can have a car accident on the way home. We don't know what the future holds. But we do know that one day we will have to stand before the righteous, perfect judge and give an account of our lives. But for those of us here who know the risen Lord as their, their Savior, Paul doesn't leave us there with this wondering what's to come. He gives us such great hope in verse 15. And I want to close with this great promise. So for believers who have repented, who have surrendered their lives to the Lord, this is what you are promised. Starting in verse 50. I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. 
we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of our Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Let's pray. Thank you for listening to the sermon podcast of North Valley Baptist Church. For the complete sermon archive and more information about the church, please go to visit nvbc.com.